Okay. Uh, so, so far, just to quickly summarize what we've seen, it's this. We have learned how to choose an appropriate basis so that any matrix can be block diagonalized like so, where each of these AII has what property exactly? That its minimal polynomial will be of the form right and its characteristic polynomial will be of the form right so this is the overall picture for any operator a yeah we've seen that this can be done and thereafter we uh, argued that then it does make sense to take a closer look at these individual blocks because there's nothing more we can do apart from get a simplified structure for the individual blocks themselves so hereafter we decided that we shall look at only operators of this kind that is of the type aii yeah because all of these eventually stemmed from an overall characteristic polynomial that looks something like this right so this was the characteristic polynomial of the overall matrix or the operator and this was the minimal polynomial of the same right so from this given structure we brought it down to this no further simplification is possible apart from simplifications within these little blocks now now these little blocks though I say they're little blocks they can be pretty big which is why it makes sense to dive deeper into structures such as these which satisfy this property right so that led us to this statement of the theorem for Jordan canonical form how so from here this AII since it has only a single eigenvalue repeated multiple times therefore we will cast our attention on operators who have only repeated eigenvalues so that's the the entire spectrum spectrum is the set of all eigenvalues distinct eigenvalues possibly is just a singleton repeated multiple times how many times exactly as many times as the size of the matrix or the dimension of the ambient space on which the operator acts right so we are only going to look at such operators and it turns out that this a i i minus lambda i i is exactly what we defined as n i and we thereafter saw that this is a nil potent matrix right nil potent because if you raise it to a certain power sufficiently large power then this entire matrix n i to some power r r i let's say will become exactly the zero matrix yeah what is the justification well it just stems from this right if you substitute a i i here and take a i i minus lambda i i then that raised to the power f i is exactly going to give you zero so it's only obvious so this nil potent matrix now if we consider what is its minimal polynomial we argued that the minimal polynomial for this n i is going to be nothing but x to the power what f i right that's exactly what we saw so I'm just recapitulating what we've seen so far quickly please ask if at any point uh, you seem to have forgotten certain things or how the things fit into the place right so this is what we saw so this is the minimal polynomial so based on this nil potent now I can get rid of this i index because now I'm focusing on any individual block irrespective of whether it is one one two two I'm only going to be focusing on blocks that look like this so let me just get rid of this i index here 
it's well understood at this point that we have only such operators in our mind and not this general operator, but only such operators for which these conditions are true. That is, these following conditions are going to hold. Right? Makes sense, right? So this is what we are going to consider. And based on this nilpotent matrix, we then said that there is a special choice of basis which gives such operators A, a very special look or appearance when represented as a matrix. And that is exactly the Jordan canonical form. We of course did not tell you explicitly what that form was. We only made the statement of the Jordan canonical form. So I'll repeat the statement of the Jordan canonical form a little less formally. I had stated it the other day. I'm just going to quickly summarize what it said. It said that if you have an operator like so, all right? So of course, this D I can replace with N when I'm considering the entire operator to act on an n-dimensional vector space, then it's just N. No doubts on this, right? So what are we saying? We're saying that this A acts on this vector space V to itself and satisfies, let's give it a star. Star is true, okay? Then there exists V1, V2 until Vk such that n raised to the power m v1 v1, n raised to the power m v2, sorry, v1 minus 1 v1 until v1, okay? So when I say this A, of course, you know that you can always choose an N like this. So from this A, you cook up this N. And then for that particular N, all right, next uh, block would begin from N raised to the power M V2, V2, so on till V2. Likewise, you keep going until you arrive at N raised to the power m vk vk until vk is a basis for v and n raised to the power m v1 v1 n raised to the power m v2 v2 until n raised to the power m v k v k is a basis for, remember what this was a basis for? Kernel of n, right? Right? What does this mean? What does that tell you about these numbers mv1, mv2, mvk and so on? What does it tell you? How do you arrive at these numbers? Yeah, the sum. So how many entries? Good, good, good point. So how many entries are here? mv1 plus 1 plus mv2 plus 1 plus mv3 plus 1. So that is summation mvi, i is equal to 1 through k plus k. Because it starts from the power n, n to the power 0. So there are k such n to the power zeros. So there are k vectors like v1 through vk. And then there are mv1, mv2, mv3. So of course, from this, a simple calculation leads you to conclude that n is equal to summation mvi, i is equal to 1 through k plus k, right? The next conclusion about from what can you draw from here? Look, 
these are parts of a basis. So they must be linearly independent. So none of these can be zero. However, the moment you hit this with one more n, then they must be zero because they are a basis for the kernel of n, right? So up to the powers of n till mv1, if you hit v1 with such powers up to the power mv1, none of them can be zero. But the moment you hit it with one more power, that is mv1 plus one, then it becomes zero, right? Similarly for mv2, similarly for mv3. So those are the characteristic defining features of these numbers mv1, mv2, mv3, so on, right? So this is what the statement is, very loosely speaking. I've given a more formal statement the previous day, but this is what more or less it means. Before we dive into the proof of this, let us try and understand the consequence. That is, what is so special about such a basis? Assuming that I agree that this is my ordered basis for the vector space V, what would this matrix A, or rather first let's see what would this matrix N, the matrix representation of N look like under this basis? Once we know what N looks like under this basis, we can of course just add lambda I subject to a basis and we get the representation of A. In other words, before we even invest our time and efforts behind proving this Jordan canonical form, we should at least convince ourselves that it is a desirable form to have, right? And it's short of a diagonal form, this is the best you can do, apparently. So let's test that claim out. So N subject to this basis, where well, this is the basis. Uh, so let's define this as the basis, okay? Subject to this basis, what does it look like? It's going to look like n acting on n to the power mv1, v1, its basis representation, then n acting on n to the power mv1 minus 1, v1, subject to that basis. You, you with me on this? That's what, that's how you understand the representation of an operator as a matrix. It's action on members of the basis represented in terms of that same basis. These are vectors, right? So it goes all the way up to n's action on vk, is it not? What do you think happens here? The first column. It's all zeros, right? So the first column is entirely zero. What about the second column? This turns out to be the first basis, does it not? Because now minus one plus one. So this turns out to be one. Because the representation of this, this becomes the first basis now. The representation of the first basis as a coordinate is just one, zero, 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 like this. Agreed? Let me just complete the first chain. So that is n uh, acting on v1. Of course, there are others. What about the second one by the same argument? If you let n act on n raised to the mv1 minus 2 v1, it just becomes n raised to the mv1 minus 1 v1, which is now the second basis. Representation of the second basis as a coordinate is 0, 1, 0, 0, with a 1 at the second position. So this next fellow becomes 0, 1, 0, like so, until you arrive at this, right? What is this? In the, in the order, this is the, if you, if you look at it from this way, one, two, three, four, like this. You have eventually gotten to how many? The entry previous to this. By action of n on v1, you have obtained n v1, which is the entry just preceding this. So in terms of the ordering of the basis, what is the number of this? This is the first basis, first element in the basis, second element in the basis, third element in the basis. What, is, what element is this of the basis? mb1 minus 1, right? So you have 0, 0 everywhere until you arrive at the 
m v1 minus 1 position and it will have a 1 there. Yeah? Everything else is 0 below it. Next element is you start with n raised to the mv2 acting on v2 and let n act on it. Again, that's going to be 0 because each of these fellows, each of these fellows belong to the kernel of n. Do they not? So again, you have another full column of zeros. So what is the size of this fellow, by the way? So if I am allowed to look at it like so, wouldn't you agree that this is mv1 cross mv1? Yeah? Yeah. So mv1 minus 1 is this. But if I am considering this, I want a square, right? If I want a square, then I would have to take only this. But I am also considering one extra column. So I have to go one row below, right? So it is mv1 cross mv1, right? By the same token, if you carry on like this, what form do you expect? Then you will have subsequently by the same argument, although this does not look square, this is mv2 cross mv2, like so. In the, in the, sorry, in the? MV1 cross MV1. MV1 cross MV1. Yeah, yeah. Taking the, because the diagonal elements of this have to be 0. This has a very special structure in the sense that the super diagonal, the first super diagonal is all 1s. Yeah, the diagonals are all zeros. <coughs> yeah, I hope the counting is clear, how this is going. See, the first one is 0. The second one is the first vector this one, the third one is the second vector, the fourth one is the third vector, so on, till this fellow is what? There were how many generated here? Oh, there was mv1 plus 1. So mv1 plus 1, right? Yeah, sorry about that. So we, we didn't keep actually keep count of this. So this is basically mv1 plus 1. Because you see how many are there this in this block? 1, 2, 3 until this is mv1. This is n hitting it 0 times until n hitting it mv1 times. So total there are mv1 plus 1 fellows here. And you are going to have to study the effect of the action of n on mv1 plus 1 fellows here. Yeah, so it is mv1 plus 1. So I think this will then be the mv1, mv, mv, mv1 th position. Yeah? Yeah, I was not very sure of the counting myself. So this is mv1 plus 1. Yeah, then it adds up because now this is mv1 plus 1. The second one will be mv2 plus 1. Likewise, if you keep adding, it is just summation mvi plus k, which is exactly what the size of the matrix should be because that is what m is. Right? So the point I'm making is that you have these. So this block is of size mv1 plus 1 times mv1 plus 1. But the same holds for every other block, right? Every time you start letting n act on one of these sequences generated by individual vks, this is exactly what you are going to get. If you follow the argument, I am just showing it for the first one. But in general, or rather in a special case, for example, just because it gets too messy. Okay, so we are taking a special example here. Let's say n is equal to 7 and k is equal to 2. Okay? So there are two such vectors, v1 and v2. All right? Now, if the numbers have to add up, let's just say that one of them generates of a size mv1 is equal to what? 3 and the other generates mv2 is equal to 2. Okay? So let's say mv1 is equal to 3, mv2 is equal to 2. Just taking a special case. So what happens? 
then 1 0 0 0 0 0 0 then 0 1 0 0 0 0 0 and then finally the last term will be 0 0 1 0 0 0 0. Next you start with n raised to the mv2 which is n squared v2 but n cubed v2 is 0 that is how mv2 is defined right. With respect to v2 if you keep hitting it with n if you hit it thrice that is when you first encounter a 0 up to 2 times you still do not get a 0 right. So, when you hit let n act on n squared v2 it just becomes 0. So, this will again be 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 right. Next when you hit it what do you get? You get n squared v2 but n squared v2 is which element? So, let us just write down the basis here. So, the basis is n cubed v1 n squared v1 n v1 v1. So, this is 7 dimensional vector space you need 7 elements in the basis then n squared v2 n v2 and v2. So, by Jordan's theorem by the Jordan form this is apparently a basis. So, so far we have not proved but let us agree that Jordan's theorem is true Jordan form is valid then this is a basis by our claim for such a matrix like this. So, now this is the action this is the result of action of n on this that leads to this. So, this sorry that leads to leads to 0 this is the result of action of n on this which gives me n cubed v 1 that is the first element. So, the representation of this fellow is what 1 0 0 0 0 0 0 the representation of this fellow is what 0 1 0 0 0 0 0 yeah you get the idea right until this last fellow has a representation 0 0 0 0 0 0 1 clear I hope this is clearer now with this example what we are doing yeah so not such abstract things anymore just giving you a numerical example to illustrate the case. <coughs> you can you see these numbers you can play around with I am just choosing a specific case. So, what happens this is 0 next what happens this is 1 2 3 4 5. So, now I have to study the effect on the 6th element 1 2 3 4 5 6. So, I am hitting this with n I get this but what is this follows representation in terms of the basis 1 2 3 4 5. So, in the 5th position I must have a 1 and 0 is elsewhere. So, 0 0 0 0 1 0 0 next one similarly will be 0 0 0 0 0 1 0 yeah. So, that is it. So, you agree that this is going to be the representation of n under this basis. So, any nil potent matrix <laughs> has a basis representation like so. So, I can split it up now what is the size of this 4 cross 4 4 is m v 1 plus 1. So, it is m v 1 plus 1 cross m v 1 plus 1 3 is m v 2 plus 1. So, m v 2 plus 1 cross m v 2 plus 1 and the numbers indeed add up and give you 7 m v 1 plus m v 2 plus 2 is equal to 7 right. So, this is the typical form. Now, I have gotten a representation of n. So, what? How does this help me in getting a representation of how does this help me in getting a representation for a? In other words what would any operator a look like such that the nil potent matrix was basically a minus lambda i. So, I am only looking at operators which have repeated eigenvalues all repeated eigenvalues ok right whose algebraic multiplicity is equal to the dimension of the space itself. Hmm? So, that means I have a minus lambda i because after all this is n right that looks in this special form right. In fact, I could have had multiple here I just have 2, but in general I will have k such blocks right. So, I could have split them up like this you know and only these blocks would matter. 
And each of these blocks has a very special structure with only ones in the super diagonals and zeros everywhere else. So now, if I wanted the representation of A in terms of this basis, what do you think it's going to be? Just lambdas added to the diagonals, is it not? Yeah, because this is an operator, this is an operator. You can check that phi 1 plus phi 2 represented under a basis is nothing but phi 1's representation under that basis plus phi 2's representation under that basis, is it not? <coughs> phi 1 and phi 2 are linear operators on a vector space. So if the sum of the operators under a basis is given by the sums of individual, because this is after all the sum of the two matrices representing the two operators and this is the operators you have taken the sum already in the abstract sense and then you are representing it, it doesn't matter. So similarly here also A is the representation I want to find out. I have A minus lambda is representation. So let me just add lambda is representation to it. But lambda is representation under any basis. It doesn't matter. It's an identity map. It's just going to be the lambda sitting on the diagonals, no? Right? So therefore the Jordan form for A would look something like this. What is, what is that? Lambdas on the diagonals and except for certain ones in super diagonals at some special locations, not at every super diagonal by the way necessarily, yeah? Because you see the point at which it branches off from one block to another, there is a zero in the super diagonal, yeah? So you will essentially have maybe a, even a singleton lambda is like this, it's possible, right? So let's say you have one like this. So this is basically a five cross five representation for instance. Oh, not five, three, four, five, six. So there's a six cross six representation, but in general, it could have any arbitrary shape. So this is always going to be the best you can do because this is not exactly diagonal, but it's as close to diagonal as it gets, right? So that is the reason why we are investing on this Jordan form. Because once you've gotten it down to this form, it's really good because if you think even in terms of the differential equation, at least this, this and this equation, these three are decoupled completely, right? You think about the differential equation represented by this particular row and this particular row and this particular row, they're decoupled. And every other row, it's only coupled with one other variable which you have already solved. So it's like a triangular solution, right? You solve for the first one, the one that is completely decoupled, know its solution because it's after all a first order differential equation. Plug it back into the one preceding it, get that one and so on. And then you have solved for this entire block. So even within those individual AIIs, look at the big picture now, even within those individual AIIs, you have managed to break it down into simpler blocks and even each of those simpler blocks have the best possible representation you can think of, not just any arbitrary triangular representation, but a very special triangular representation where nothing other than the super diagonal, the first super diagonal is allowed to be non-zero. That too, there are only ones, not just any arbitrary number, right? It's a fantastic result in so far as decoupling goes. Of course, these days people don't invest too much time in uh, studying this because people are more into the numerical part of it, but it's a very useful result because if you're trying to prove something about eigenvalues, you cannot assume them to be, the matrices to be diagonalizable in general. So the first assumption you make is, okay, let us start with the Jordan canonical form of this matrix, which looks like so. And then you test out your hypothesis. If you can prove it for the Jordan canonical form, it means you've proved everything there was to prove about it, right? I'll just summarize quickly a couple more things about this before we get into the proof during the next module. First, so this was, this was clear, right? I'll retain the proof of the Jordan canonical form. I mean, the statement of the Jordan canonical form. <coughs> so you see, nilpotent matrices can go to zero in any arbitrary way, but not these fellows. You take, for instance, uh, okay, let's, why am I making life complicated for myself? Let me take a small size, one, one, zero, 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 zero. So every nilpotent matrix does not have to look like this. It is only when we do it in the Jordan canonical form that a nilpotent matrix will look like this. 
So let us say this is n. What do you think is n squared going to be? If you just try it out, you will see it is just shifted once, one super diagonal up. Yeah? And if you hit it once more, it just goes off. So it is just knocked off one super diagonal at a time. So it is very clearly visible what is going on here. Right? And that is another great thing about this particular form of a nil potent matrix. Just do well to remember that. Now, if I tell you that this A matrix, which has all its eigenvalues identical, repeated, yeah, has a representation like this under the Jordan canonical form, that is the Jordan basis. So I can sort of split it up into let us say 3, it could be 5, 10, any number, but I am just considering 3. Suppose this is the largest Jordan block. So each of these, by the way, starting with n to the, v, uh, m, n to the m v1, v1 through till v1, this is the Jordan chain, oh sorry, the Jordan block generated by this v1. This entire thing is the Jordan chain. Okay. So the Jordan block generated by v1 is of size mv1 plus 1 cross mv1 plus 1. So if you look at the largest of those fellows and you look at a minus lambda i represented in this, then what do you think is the minimal polynomial given by of a minus lambda i? So I am putting it to you, it is exactly equal to what? the largest block size will govern it because every time you are raising this to higher and higher powers that of that, that first super diagonal gets pushed one step at a time. So the largest one will, 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 will be 0 last. All other sub blocks have already been 0 by then. So in fact the degree of the minimal polynomial of this which is f is determines, it determines the size of the largest Jordan block in the entire Jordan chain for lambda for a given eigenvalue. I will repeat it once more. We have plenty of numbers. One number is the algebraic multiplicity, one number is the geometric multiplicity, the other number is the multiplicity of that eigenvalue as it appears or multiplicity of its root as it appears in the minimal polynomial which is f. What I am saying now is that when you have the Jordan canonical form that f is telling you something about the Jordan canonical form. It is telling you the largest possible Jordan block for the eigenvalue. So suppose in the characteristic polynomial x minus 2 appears 3 times, that is it is x minus 2 cubed. But in the, in the minimal polynomial, suppose you have x minus 2 squared. What does that mean? It means that the largest Jordan block for 2 is of size 2. However, the algebraic multiplicity is 3. So the Jordan chain is of size 3. But the largest Jordan block sitting in it is of size 2. So in that case you can uniquely specify the Jordan canonical form how it will look just from the characteristic polynomial and the minimal polynomial. However, I leave it to you as a thought exercise. Is this always possible to determine? If I just tell you the characteristic polynomial and the, and the minimal polynomial, is it always possible for you to uniquely be able to characterize the Jordan form how it is going to look? It is not. Just increase the number, ramp it up. Let us say the algebraic multiplicity is 5, so that it is x minus 2 to the 5. And let us say the minimal polynomial is what? x minus 2 squared, right? That means you have the largest size being 2. So you could have technically a 2 by 2 block sitting here, and you could have had 1 by 1 block, 1 by 1 block, and 1 by 1 block. Right? This corresponds to a 5 cross 5 matrix in the Jordan canonical because diagonals are special cases of the Jordan canonical form, right? So you have still have a 5 cross 5. On the other hand, someone else might come up with 2 cross 2, then 2 cross 2, so 2, 3, 4, 5, yeah, and 1. So these are both going to satisfy the property what? 
that the minimal polynomial is x minus 2 whole squared. The characteristic polynomial is x minus 2 to the power 5. But the Jordan forms, of course, permutations are allowed. But even if you allow permutations, can you make this one look ever like this? These are completely different Jordan forms, even though they share the same characteristic and minimal polynomials. So be very careful. Just those two numbers are not enough. But suppose I also tell you the geometric multiplicity. Then can you fix it up? Because in this case, apparently the geometric multiplicity is what? The geometric multiplicity is also hiding somewhere in here. Can you tell me what the geometric multiplicity is in those two? Number of blocks, exactly. Because the number of blocks are exactly telling you the dimension of the kernel. And the dimension of the kernel is exactly the geometric multiplicity. Right? So this one has a geometric multiplicity of 3, whereas this one has a geometric multiplicity of 4. Right? So apparently these two share the same minimal polynomial, the same characteristic polynomial, and therefore the same algebraic multiplicity, but they don't share the same geometric multiplicity. Again, I'll not answer this question, but I urge you to think about it. If now I next fix up characteristic polynomial, minimal polynomial, and geometric multiplicity to be the same, then must those two matrices with the same eigenvalues have the same Jordan form? Permutations are allowed. Permutations are allowed. So up to a permutation, we consider it to be the same Jordan form. Someone puts the 3 by 3 block here. Someone puts a 5 by 5 block here. Someone else decides to put the 5 by 5 block first and the 3 by 3. That's just a reordering of the basis. Something that you call as a V1, your friend calls as a V2. That's permitted. That's just a permutation or reordering of the basis. So up to a permutation, are those Jordan forms identical? So just think about it. I'll not answer this question. But it's food for thought, right? Now, with all of that in place, I suppose you understand that this Jordan form does give us some very nice properties and structures. So it is worth our while, therefore, to dive into a proof of this, which is what we're going to do now in the next module.